Discord, there we go. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we have Joey Crenshaw. He is the Joint Polar Satellite System Spacecraft Operations Lead working with NASA. And uh, I will I not give another <laughs> introduction, further introduction. Go ahead, Joey. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, as Christina said, I'm the spacecraft operations lead for the Joint Polar Satellite System. I'm working on a one of the pre-launch satellites, actually, right now, and it's uh, going to be the JPSS-2 satellite. It's slated to launch in September of 2022, and uh, it will be a, an additional polar orbiting satellite that will be used for weather forecasting uh, with the uh, in the existing NOAA uh, yeah, NOAA Constellation. Um, so this really is my pleasure to come in and talk to you guys about what I do, which is the satellite operations. And I do a lot of the command and control aspect and really the data retrieval. I do have some knowledge of the, uh, the instrumentation on board and I <clears throat> uh, will we'll talk to some of that a little bit. Um, but uh, with, I guess, with, but feel free to interrupt me with questions as we go along. And I guess without further ado, I'll get you through these uh, slides. Um, and I wanted to make sure I left a lot of time at the end for uh, questions as well. So on this opening slide, uh, Christina was kind enough to give me some contextual information of the kind of things that you all are learning and covering in your classes. And uh, she let me know that she is covering uh, geostationary, yeah, geostationary satellites or geosynchronous satellites and um, polar orbiting satellites. And as I had said, I work on the polar orbiting satellites and they're the ones that orbit close to Earth. So in this cloud of, let's see if I can get this annotation right. So in this cloud of satellites surrounding the Earth in this picture, they're the ones nestled right up on it. And they are at a varying altitudes, somewhere between 300 and 500 miles, miles above the, uh, or miles of al altitude, orbiting at about 16,000 miles an hour. So every hour and a half, they complete an orbit. And in every orbit, they catch a different swath of information uh, that will be fed into the meteorology algorithms. And on the outer edge, you see our geosynchronous satellites. And I'm not as well versed with them, but I do know that once they reach their orbits, they stay basically locked in place right above the Earth, so they can catch a full frame or a uh, yeah, a full yeah, full frame picture of their visible hemisphere of the Earth for more uh, real time weather monitoring, so that we can see things as they are, versus the polar orbiting, which is used for uh, forecasting. So. Moving along and then exiting that. Uh, really, every satellite that is used in our constellations, whether they be the geosync or the polar orbiting satellites, um, use multi channel optical sensors to observe various wavelengths of visible and invisible light. Um, and really, these sensors and these uh, sounders are taking in. Uh, a lot of the visible light and a lot of the microwave and infrared light that is used for temperature data, humidity data, of course, real-time pictures. Uh, this full, this full hat, or yeah, the full, full picture of the Earth that you're seeing here was taken by the GOES R satellite, uh, one of the geosync ones, and it was during the. I want to say it was the winter of 2017. So you can really see, like we have the, whoa, didn't mean to do that. We have the, the Western hemisphere in view. You can see where we are. You can see the, the snow system that was moving through at that time to blanket much of the Midwest and eventually the East Coast and a lot of snow. I think that was the, uh, the Jonah system that came through. And, um, on the smaller image, you'll see one of the pictures that's captured by one of the polar orbiting satellites. And you can see the steam trails of the shipping lanes that are offside or off the, uh, the coast of Spain. And 
Let's see. So those are two main examples, but the science behind it is essentially the sensors that are on board are used to absorb light and electro <clears throat> and light is electromagnetic radiation and it has various different categories or yeah, various different energy levels and categories that are used to that are used by the sensors to provide the data that we're looking for. Um, the four sensors or instrument suites that are on the satellite that I'm working on currently are called the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounding Suite. So it is paying attention or looking to absorb uh, wavelengths in the microwave range. There is the, hold on, I wrote these down because like I said, I'm on the satellite side. There's the cross-track infrared sounder, which is taking in infrared light. And uh, ATMS and Chris, as they're called, you know, colloquially, are the two primary uh, instruments that we use for our forecast data. Uh, the sounding instruments that's taken that take in the microwave and the infrared information uh, feed a lot of the data of their data straight into the weather algorithms that are used by the European Meteorology Associations and uh, the American Me Meteorology Association. So really, these weather satellites provide international data to or provide international data to an international community. Um, moving right along on the other instruments on my on my bird satellite excuse me uh there's the ozone mapping profile profiler suite which takes in mostly microwave and some infrared and it is currently being used to study the changes of you guessed it the ozone density in the atmosphere and i've got a couple pictures of that one coming up and finally the show pony of my satellite is the visible infrared imaging radiometer suite which takes in from the infrared through the visible and takes extremely pretty pictures and is used to it's the closest thing that we have on my bird to the the real-time monitoring of a uh, of weather and it's really used to capture in in detail pictures and photos of pre and post weather events and you'll see that uh or that's what it's what it's really known for and you'll see that coming up um again this is a very very zoomed out uh theoretical level of the uh the mathematics that are being involved that are that are used here and Many years ago, I could have gone on about black bodies and Stefan Boltzmann con or constants and all that sort of stuff, but it's that has since left my brain. So please be easy on me if you have any questions on this slide. Um, so, like I had said, um, the the reason why these instruments are designed the way they are to sense the different wavelengths is that different materials, different chemicals, different molecules absorb, react, and emit different wavelengths of light. And those signatures are what is used to determine the temperature on the ground, the level of moisture in the air, the level of ozone across the altitude of the uh, yeah, across the altitude of the uh, of the atmosphere, really just a ton of information, and uh, the based on the type of light being emitted or the type of light trying to be sensed, different materials will be used to sense that light <clears throat> or sense that, and they're built into the sensors and uh, circuits that really read in the data and record it to the, uh, the spacecraft. Um, any questions so far? All right, cool. It's not going a lot faster than I thought. Um, so I wanted to throw this one up there. This was, this is a picture 
an artist's rendering of the satellite that I worked on previously, the uh, JPSS-1 satellite. And it's got all of, the inf all of the instruments that I had mentioned before and the series instrument, which is used for sensing cloud and Earth's um, radiation emission to really get a better sense of how much energy Earth itself is putting out at any given time. Um, and you all are interested in meteorology and not necessarily the engineering behind it, so we don't need to go over all the other components that are, that are on this. But um, there is a lot of, in addition to the instrument suites, there's a lot of complex mechanical engineering that goes on in the command and control of the spacecraft uh, that is, to me, just plain fascinating. So if you have plenty, of, we have, if we got time for those questions, I'll field those all day. Let's see. So um, I wanted to give you guys good, good examples of the kind of data and the kind of pictures that these meteorological satellites are taking and um, really the images that they can capture. So I threw in some examples. Um, these are side-by-side -side pictures of taken by VIRS, the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, of when Hurricane Maria barreled through the Caribbean, <clears throat> and in particular, uh, Puerto Rico, back in 2017. Uh, what you can see is that VIRS has different levels or, or different operational modes for whether it is in uh, on the daylight side of Earth or the night light or the nighttime side of Earth, because since it is a polar satellite, it'll over the course of its orbit orbit uh, go through day and night uh, sixteen times a day. And on the daylight side, you can see it takes very very incredibly high resolution pictures of the the weather below it, and in particular the strong formation of a. Let's see, let's see if I can get good with the annotation again. A strong formation of um, Hurricane Maria's eye, which I think at that time was category four, four or five. It was an incredibly strong storm. And, um, whoa, nope. And before, and on the, for, for the nighttime sensing, uh, you can see that the, other operational mode for when beers is uh, observing, obs absorbing more light or calibrated for the, the nighttime rather. It can, you, it'll show us what uh, Puerto Rico had looked like and how much vibrance and um, activity there was before Maria had hit. And then the levels of change of that vibrance after Maria had hit. So, It's unfortunate and, or yeah, an unfortunate event, but it's really, really well captured by our satellites. And um, let's see, so we'll move past the Veer's image. And as I had said, this is, so Chris, this is one of the images from our cross track infrared sounder. And the infrared data is used to give you the temperature measurements of all over the earth. And so this is much more of a conventional overlay that on a global scale of you might see for a, uh, of the, uh, the weather, yeah, the weather, temp the, the temperatures at any given point. Uh, the scale is listed down here below and it is in Kelvin. So unfortunately, if you want to know what it would, feel like you'd probably have to convert it to Celsius and then Fahrenheit. But um, just like you would see on the evening news or AccuWeather.com, red is incredibly hot. So Australia, nice and warm, the desert, the Sahara, and uh, the, uh, the Kalahari deserts, good and warm as usual. And blue is very cold. So this must have been a northern hemisphere winter because we've got it pretty mild in the in the mid Atlantic in the U.S. and it looks pretty cold in in Canada. Uh, let's see what's next. This is an an image from the ozone mapping profiler suite, 
and it is giving you the levels of ozone at uh, various locations across the earth. And as you can see, the ozone hole that is being monitored and is actually recovering on the <clears throat> at, at the South Pole is still there, but the high levels of ozone coming uh, just outside of it show that there is repair happening and the mitigating factors, at least for the ozone layer depletion that we're putting in place as a, as a planet are in fact working. And these are, this is being monitored around the clock by a full constellation of, or several constellations of satellites. Let's see. Joy, just uh, sorry for the interruption. I have several students here that have been writing on the chat saying that they are engineering students and would love to hear all the functions of the parts and designs and work put into the satellites. Uh, so once you're done with the overall description, if you can go back to those slides and- Yeah, sure. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I think I've got some in the, um, in the background, but let's go back to, or in the backup slides. But we can go back here. Uh, from an engineering standpoint, what you can see here is that we have the solar array, which is while the, while the satellite is on orbit, what is providing power. It's just basically a giant three panel solar panel that is powering all of the instruments and the rest of the engineering components. Uh, the HRD antenna that is listed here and these other TDRS antennas Really, the antennas are used to communicate to the satellite, uh, or communicate to and from the satellite and the data downlink from the satellite. And that is all done through various different channels of uh, radio waves. Um, if you're looking for the specifics on that one, a lot of the polar satellites, I can't get into geo, although I'd imagine they use X-band, but a lot of the polar satellites rely on X-band, S-band, and K-A-band which are different uh, radio wave frequencies which provide different levels of bandwidth for the types of interaction with the satellite you're looking for, looking to uh, complete. S-band is usually, or S-band is not usually, but it's usually used for command and telemetry. So whenever I want to command the spacecraft or see what the spacecraft is recording or the status of the spacecraft, I will be looking at an S-band feed. And that has a limited bandwidth because a lot of the telemetry that comes down is really concise and engineering information that doesn't really make it past the control room. The X band and the KA band are the two bands that are used for direct broadcast of the forecasting data and the uh, directed or yeah, directed or contacted uh, downlink of the forecasting data. Both of those provide greater bandwidth and greater, uh, not link margin, S-band gives you greater link margin, but X-band and K-band give you more limited link margin, meaning that it's harder to lock on the signal, but once you get the signal, it gives you a greater bandwidth of data that can come down. Uh, so for a lot of the data downlinks that we will get from the spacecraft, we use KA band since we're pulling, since that gives us the greatest bandwidth and that'll allow us to pull down the most amount of data at any one time in a contact. And uh, X band is actually used for direct broadcast to all users. So if you're looking for honestly a fun project on the side that you could use, that you can do with a Raspberry Pi and a coat hanger and some electrical tape, there is documentation available on the JPSS, NESDIS, or NOAA websites, which will give you the X-band direct broadcast signal frequency and data uh, decommutation algorithms so that you can set up your own personal weather station in your backyard with the data that'll be coming down from these satellites. Each satellite has a different signature and different um, algorithms for unlocking the data, but it is available and it is a public resource. Um, let's see, what else is there? Joe, you have a question here. Um, Carl is asking, Starlink also use, uses K-band as well? 
right? And um, that is transmitted from the sat satellite, I'm assuming, to the ground, right? That is correct. The KA band is tr transmitted from the satellite to the ground. Uh, actually, for the, I really hope these annotations are working. For the closest analogy or analog to that on this satellite, you can see, so this SMD to ground, ground antenna, that is the KA band antenna that beams the signal to the ground stations are yeah to the ground stations where that will be receiving that signal and um the smd to tdris antenna uh beams the signal from the satellite up to what are called tracking and data relay satellites which then receive that signal and then beam a forwarded signal down to the ground so yes k band is I, I understand and see why Starlink is using KA band because like I said, it gives you the greatest data bandwidth and for what Starlinks are being used for, that information exchange will be uh, pretty quick, I'd imagine. The issue with KA band is that it is sensitive to weather changes. So your if you if you get on SpaceX's Starlink uh, internet and you're relying on that for your internet, uh, service, you probably probably will see some spotty service as storms roll through. Thunderstorms, hurricanes, really any dense formation, cloud formations or, or electrically active systems will uh, interfere with the KA band link. And that's something that we as satellite controllers have to work around and then also mitigate in various different ways. We also have another question here. Um, how is the power stored on the satellite to remain functioning when not in the vicinity to use the energy from the sun? Great question. Batteries. Um, every electrical power system on every satellite has to work in, especially in polar orbiting satellites, has to be able to work and store the energy brought from the sun and use that in the eclipse part of its orbit. And the way that it's done is while it's in the sun, the solar array is being powered and pro providing direct power to all of the components on the satellite. What it's also doing is a good portion of that power is being routed through or, bypa or is bypassing the other components and being routed straight to a some type of battery, battery assembly. Uh, a lot of them have been using big nickel metal hydride cells. Um, the last, the JPSS-1 used a lot of, used big lithium ion cells. Um, I forget what the cells, I don't, I don't know, I forget what the cells are from the top of my head for my current satellite. I think they're lithium ion too. But um, regardless of the chemical makeup of the batteries, the Electricity flows to them and they are charged while the satellite is in uh, orbit. As soon as the satellite components realize that they are leaving orbit, uh, as you could imagine, the telemetry that we see also gets communicated to the flight software on board of the spacecraft. And once the satellite itself recognizes that, hey, we are no longer in sunlight, we're not receiving any charge or any light on the solar array, solar array let's kick on the batteries and the batteries take over and provide uh, the power to the rest of the components. And that um, charge, dischar charge discharge cycle uh, is ongoing through the, <clears throat> excuse me, full life of the satellite and is sized as such. And a lot of them, not even a lot of them, all of them are built in such a way to have plenty of safety margins so that if we lose a cell or if there's a micrometeorite uh, collision that takes out some of the battery cells that there's enough extra capacity to allow for the satellites to continue to function with degraded or destroyed pieces of the battery. I should probably pay attention to the chat. I've been monitoring the, the chat. Do you have another question is what is the life expectancy of the satellite? Seven years. Uh, seven years is the drawing margin or the design margin that every satellite that I've worked on was um, is given. But just because they're designed for seven years doesn't mean that they don't exceed those 
exceed that life lifespan by a, a huge margin. Uh, the first satellite I actually worked on just turned what year? Twenty one. Yeah, yeah. It just turned twenty one. Uh, it was launched in December fifteenth, nineteen ninety nine. It's oh wait, it's about to turn twenty one. Excuse me. <laughs> and um, it's been up and providing weather data since then. Uh, the sister satellites to that one were launched in 2004 and 2006 and are still doing the same. Uh, the precursor satellite to J1 was launched in 2015 and is still going strong. Uh, they've just started the discussions on whether or, not they're not, whether or not they want to continue its operations or keep it as a backup or dump it into the Pacific Ocean. Um, <clears throat> once uh, the satellite that I'm currently working on goes up, which is uh, the J2 satellite. And J1 was launched 2018. So short answer, seven years, long answer. It could be anywhere from a failure on the launch pad to well into legal drinking age. Uh, you have another student or uh, another person asking a question here. Uh, will your spacecraft use lighter, and how does sorry, and how do spacecrafts account for that energy consumption of lighter? Do they use ice set? Do they use lighter, light, or wide Earth? Uh, I believe that's. I mean, that's what my uh, brother-in-law is using for his geomorphology uh, research, lighter radar. Um, which is usually used from planes, from what oh, I understand. From what I, oh, LIDAR, gotcha. That, I, it didn't come in clearly. Um, my satellites don't use that. I haven't, I don't have any sat experience with satellites that have used that. That doesn't mean it's not in use. Excuse me. Um, but good question, and I, I can't help you, but I, I, I'd encourage you to research it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, any other ones? You have some interest on the links that you were referring to. If you can send me those sites later, um, I can forward them to the participants. Thank you. Can do. So let's get back. We did Chris. We did Ump's. Veers. Um, yeah. So these are the very, very, very pretty pictures that Beers brings down to us. And uh, I like this one because this shows you really the, the level of detail that Beers can capture from being 824 kilometers in the, in the sky. And uh, this is Veers capturing the smoke trails from, the, from any year of the California wild, wildfires. It's a shame that they've been going on and are now just a perennial thing. I think this one was 20... 17 or 2018 but um but yeah I, I i just like this one because of the detail it captures and the way that they're getting really good at overlaying all the uh you know not you know um geographical uh and political state lines and borders and all that let's see and this is another one of the Veer's daytime or Veer's night or follow on from the Veer's night night mode for uh, the the Puerto Rico follow on. I'm really sorry for anyone who has family on Puerto Rico who had to make it through the storm. For I hope to not bring back bring back any uh, bad memories. But the the Veer's night uh night band is just showing off in these pictures so I, it was the easiest ones to go with and um getting past the meteorology part and going into the engineering and mathematics as you guys would imagine polar orbiting satellites and even geosynchronous satellites like they've got to have ground stations that they uh communicate with so that we can receive the data command and control the space spacecraft and all that and these are the various facilities that NOAA uses for their um, satellite constellations. And as you would imagine, with polar satellites, you'd expect a lot of 
polar ground stations since they will get the most visibility the most consistently throughout the uh <clears throat> 16 orbits that these satellites will complete will complete every day um i'm really 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 hoping that my project sends me to uh svalbard norway the most frequently used uh northern north pole ground station or the uh or trollstad or mcmurdo down in antarctica because aside from just being cool locations the technology and the the uh antenna builds that happen there are just incredible um it's really tough to get scale on the pictures that i've shown you here for how big these antennas are but they are absolutely massive and due to the harsh weather and the harsh climate that they're placed in they usually use humvees essentially to drive tools to and from the uh the, the different satellites as they're performing their maintenance. Um, and on top of that, there are still other uh, auxiliary ground stations that are placed all over the earth. A lot of the other ones that are not polar are used for the deep space network for a lot of the real space science data that's uh, coming down and the what NASA White Sands ground station, so the one that's in um, White Sands, New Mexico, that is the primary ground station that is used for communicating with the tracking and data relay satellites that are in geosynchronous orbit, but used to provide added contact times and uh, awareness and vision to the uh, health and safety of the satellites through that TGIS network. Um, any questions here? There's a question referring to the last, the previous slide. Uh, okay. Does the satellite, or I guess previous before that, does the satellite capture infrared temperature of California during the wildfires? And by that I mean a temperature variance, a difference between when they're experiencing fires and not experiencing fires. Yes, yes it does. And it captures it, depending on its orbit path, it'll capture it somewhere between two and four times a day and those temperature variances are fed fed down and brought into the uh, the forecasting information i guess uh, the better way to elucidate that is or yeah clarify that is that on this slide again i hope these annotations are working on this slide you can see if you look around the orbit or not the orbit the uh, equator you can see that there are white sections that aren't exactly picked up, which really go to show you the the swath or the what's being seen in every path or in every orbit that the uh, the satellite takes. So <clears throat> I say anywhere between two and four because they'll catch it at daytime, they'll catch it again at the nighttime, and depending on how these swaths line up, it'll catch it twice. It'll catch it in back-to-back -back orbits, or it may miss it in back-to-back -back orbits. But the since these instruments are constantly sensing and constantly recording, any time that they view anything, we then get that data on the subsequent contact uh, and feed it directly into the um, to the to the meteorologists that are that are using that data and. It's great because once the data gets down from the satellite, it's much easier to move it through higher bandwidth and higher uh, higher speed connections through the hardline fiber optic cables that provide us the internet. Cool, I hope. All right. No need questions at this moment. Sweet. But honestly, I think I'm all, I know I'm almost done. Uh, this is another quick one that goes into the engineering and mathematics that's uh, involved in this because essentially satellite control is just flying a fancy remote controlled anything. And um, <clears throat> there is a lot of engineering, thought, design, processing that goes into 
the not only the satellite attitude control and sensing and orientation to make sure that it's pointed properly and facing the geodetic nadir, which is essentially the the 90 degree, like the, the angle that would provide a, a 90 degree angle of sight straight down to the surface of the earth at any point uh, along its orbit. There's also tons of engineering and mathematics that needs to go into the design and execution and or design and operation of the antenna on the ground and even for the data processing. So it's it's a lot of science and math all the way through. I wasn't sure how far in depth to get into that math with these. Um, but as you can see, there's clearly going to be a lot of the use of the spherical coordinates, cylindrical coordinates, and then transferring those coordinate systems. And even the, um, what are those things called? Quaternions. Uh, using quaternions and imaginary numbers to provide the full 3D mapping or, yeah, three-dimensional navigation um, of the satellite and the antenna themselves to provide the right attitude knowledge, added pointing locations, and everything there. Um, so feel free to fire away as best you can on those questions if you want to. And yeah, I think that wraps me up. Got to end on the, uh, the Starman. Thank you, Joey. Anyone can unmute themselves at this time if they want to ask any more questions. So just in case, uh, because I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning, I'm Dr. Cardona. And uh, if you want a link to this video recording or have any more questions or want links from Joey that he hopefully would send me, you can email me at ccardona, C-C-A-R-D-O-N-A, -C -A -A, at ccbcmd.edu, and I will forward that information to you. Thank you for attending. and. Have a great day. Take it easy.